Hello and welcome to Yellow Dreams Never Die, our deep dive into the Yellow Turbans. The Dung brothers have been crushed and their rebellion violently put down. Hong Fu Song, a hero of song, but this will not be the last time we say yellow cloth wrapped around heads in rebellion. As you might have noticed, I'm not the friendly voice of Stephen, but never fear, he is here, dressed all in yellow and ready to rebel. Hi everybody. I am delighted to say, supporting my imperial mandate and providing us knowledge on the turbans, we welcome back Xiao Gongjing. Hello everyone. Warm welcome to you all. I am Jude and I will be your host for today. This is our first deep dive and the format for this will be different to our usual novel-based episodes. When we get to the end of certain key events or major death, we will do deep dives to explore the history and attempt to provide more detail than we can usually fit in during the novel episodes. Now, let us get talking about the rebels whose cause has just been so brutally crushed. We have touched upon this in the first two chapters. But Stephen, how much do the primary sources actually tell us of the Band of 184? So the primary sources don't tell us all that much. The Hu Han Chu, for example, says that Chang Zhe called himself the great virtuous teacher and that he followed Huang Lao, the Yellow Emperor. It also talks a little bit about their practices when it comes to miraculous healings. For example, that he taught his disciples to kneel and confess their failure. He then gave them blessed water and magic to heal the sick. According to the sources, many recovered, and so people followed him. The Sangozi goes into a little bit more depth, saying that masters carried staves with nine knots in. He also says that those who were healed were said to be believers in Taoism, so by implication, those who weren't healed weren't true believers. So I'm going to speculate here and suggest that this might be the reason why so many were said to be healed, because people didn't want to admit that they hadn't been healed because they wanted to be seen and accepted as true believers. Uh, we also hear a little bit about their structure in the Huhan Chu. It tells us that Chang Zhe divided his followers into 36 groups called fangs. Some were great fangs, and these had over 10,000 men in, and other small fangs contained six or seven thousand men and each fang had a leader appointed over them but that's it that's all the primary sources tell us and one of the reasons for that is that the people who won the uh, the campaign were confucian and so weren't biggest fans of a Taoist movement and so they didn't really want to say anything about these people and no prominent members of the yellow turbans survived to put down on paper their own beliefs so, Stephen, is there any fascinating little stories that might just be a little negative? Yeah, absolutely. So in the Hu Han Shu, and I'm using a, um, a translation of that done by a guy called Paul Michard, uh, we read that having killed a man to propitiate heaven, Chang Chu called himself the Lord of Heaven General. And so we're told that the yellow turbans... Um, did a human sacrifice that's what they did they did a human sacrifice to get heaven on board with them now modern scholars think that's pretty unlikely because that really doesn't fit with the character of what we know of the wider yellow turban movement so what you're saying is we shouldn't have done a human sacrifice before this deep dive i think human sacrifices are always wrong gong jin what are there positive stories little stories that give us more insight into their attitudes uh, there is actually there are actually quite a few of them, and one of them, one of the most remarkable ones, are actually about the turban's respect to scholars. Uh, for a lot of those turban attacks, they actually the turbans actually had a collective decision and agreement to not attack renowned scholars that were uh, currently living in the commanderies and the counties that they were living. And it's quite remarkable in the sense that we always have the impression that these rebels might be uh, uneducated or uncivilized, but actually maybe they weren't. So we have limited and not entirely reliable information on the turbans. Why, given the size of the vault, was so little recorded by scholars of the time, Steve? Because at the time, it probably didn't feel like they were that significant. There were various other rebellions that were going on. Even in that one year, 184 AD, we know of a few other different rebellions, uh, one called the Rice Sect, and that one uh, lasted as a rebellion for many, many years. And so... In comparison to that one, you can see why perhaps this one was considered insignificant. So we got a famous rebellion of which people are fascinated, but for which there is so little to know about. 
are we sure it was a peasant revolt or is that something that was also in dispute? Uh, no, so we're not convinced that it was a peasant rebellion um, or not entirely a peasant rebellion. For example, I recently read an article called Who Were the Yellow Turbans? A Revisionist View by a guy called Chi Yin Chen. And in it, he argues that some of the evidence that's put forward rather suggests that they weren't, um, pe- weren't just peasants. So, for example, um, there's talk of them carrying queen with them and that doesn't uh, and, and having wealth. And that rather implies that they came from a more middle class background. And he's absolutely convinced. And I found this argument particularly convincing uh, that Chang Chia and his brothers himself came from the landed gentry. And actually, that does rather make sense of how uh, they are treated by um, the Han Dynasty. One of the things that I think we picked up on a previous episode is if this uh, movement was becoming really widespread, and it was, why did the government ignore it? for so long well the zizing tong um says that the reason they were tolerated for so long was simply because chang Chia was educating his followers so what he was doing was educating them and if he's educating them that implies that he has a degree of education um, and probably education that's sanctioned by the state and actually rafe de chris bingley picks this up and he says that they've recruited members in loyang itself including eunuchs And so if they've got that following, then they probably seem like a benign group. Um, And the fact that they had followers from the various different um, levels of society means that, no, this wasn't simply a peasant rebellion. Rongjin, what are your thoughts on peasant, gentry, or mix of the two? I actually quite agree with what Finn say, uh, especially the part about where they were actually able to made a decision and actually successfully infiltrate into the various government posts. It just says that there's at least some kind of education level there and that's just not about peasants. And if I recall correctly, uh, Emperor Ling also pardoned many previously punished scholars and officials uh, in, involved in opposing the eunuchs after hearing of the rebellion. So that does seem to suggest that at least the central court uh, linked some of these rebellions with some of these perhaps unhappy officials. It might not be the peasant revolt. We don't know much about them, but at least we have the name right, don't we? Well, that's a good question. Actually, we don't. If we were wanting to refer to them as they refer to themselves, we would call them the Way of Great Peace. Um, The name Yellow Turbans is actually a hostile name placed on them by the Han government. It comes from the fact that uh, they wrapped yellow turbans around the head and uh, so they became known as the yellow scarves or the yellow turbans but that was a derogatory name and the uh, way they phrased or called themselves was the way of great peace Uh, another name uh, that they got called was the ant army because there were so many of them but again that was not meant as a compliment that was definitely used as a derogatory term i do like the ant army i am now going to change this entire podcast to referring to them as the ant army You'll lose people very quickly if you do. <laughs> what about the Way of Peace, the text that in the novel is given to Zhang Ju and for which the movement is now so well known and associated with? Yes. So the scripture on Great Peace, also known as the Taiping Jing. In the novel, Chang Ju is given the book by Gan Ji and is now synonymous with the Yellow Turbans. In fact, it's where they take their name, the Way of Great Peace. But did the Yellow Turbans actually possess that book? Well, the reason that this is a question worth exploring is that we have the remains of a book called the Taiping Jing now. And if this is a book that Chang Zhe had, then it would provide an insight into what they actually believed. And we'd actually have a source that wasn't written by those hostile to the Yellow Turbans. So a guy called B.J. Mansvelt Beck has written a great article on this topic called The Date of the Taiping Jing. He basically says that the earliest we can say a book called the Taiping Jing definitely existed is 649 AD. That's because someone quotes the Taiping Jing in another work at that time, and that quote is in our surviving material. Therefore, we know that the book then definitely existed and definitely matched what we currently have. And the description of the book in that source also fits with what we've got. It says that it was 10 chapters long, however... The title Taping Jing is mentioned even earlier in sources dating from the latter Han. Fan Yi, who wrote the Hu Han Shu, 
mentions that Changzhou had a copy of the Taiping Jing. But this version is described as having 170 chapters, not 10, like the Taiping Jing spoken about in the 7th century. Hence why there's debate about this. So are these two books connected? Well, Beck speculates that the latter hand version went through a series of editing, but he concludes his essay by saying, since no one has found positive evidence of non-hand material in the body of the text, the Taiping Jing, in spite of its shaky text history and possible rearrangement of its texts, can safely be treated as a genuine latter hand text. Basically, he says, we can't know conclusively, but his suspicion is that the text that we have today is at its core the same as what Changzhou had, and therefore we can look at it to know more about what the Yellow Turbans believe. Now, if you want to know more detail about this, then do go check out that article. It is available on JSTOR. Okay, so while we can't 100% say this was the book Changzhou had, I know you are interested in the content of the Taiping Jing. So what did it actually teach, and what it might it teach us about what the Turpins thought at the time? Yes, great question, Jude. So as I said, some of the Taiping Jing still exist today, and most of the sections from 41 to 66, in fact. And a scholar called Barbara Hendricksk has translated these chapters into English, as well as writing a superb introduction. I'm still reading it myself, but I'm loving it and I'd really recommend it to anyone who's interested in what the Yellow Turbans might have believed. Now, not all of you will know this, but my day job is actually being a vicar in the Church of England, and I find the parallels, and then the contrasts, between what this Taoist movement and Christianity believe fascinating. Let me read you Hendrix's brief summary of what the Taiping Jing teaches. The text deals with the relationship between man and heaven, man's sins against heaven, and the resulting punishment, the approaching apocalypse, and heaven's promise of salvation. Heaven's envoy, the celestial master, who speaks through the Taiping Jing, has arrived to announce this promise to the world. So Hendricks says humanity have sinned against heaven. Obviously, she's using Christian language to explain a Chinese concept to a Western audience. The language the text itself uses is the reception and transmission of evil. What that means is that their ancestors have stopped following the commands of heaven, bringing evil on them and the land. And this evil is transferred to and received by the next generation, who are then stuck committing this evil that they can do nothing about. And they're fated to pass it on, creating a chain of evil down to the current day. And the Taiping Jing teaches that this evil deserves punishment which heaven is going to bring about. However, the heavens don't want that to happen. So they send an envoy, the celestial master, to be a saviour, to teach the world to behave as heaven wants. This is a chance to change the world's behaviour so that judgment doesn't happen, a way of breaking the cycle of transferring and receiving evil. So you may be able to see the parallels with Christianity. The Bible teaches, like the Taiping Jing, that humans have sinned against God, and that they deserve punishment. But God, like the heavens in Taiping Jing, don't want that. So he sends a saviour into the world. But here's then where they differ. The Taiping Jing says that punishment will be averted by teaching. That if the celestial master tells people what they're doing wrong, their behaviour will change. Now, obviously, I'm biased. But I think the Bible has a far more realistic understanding of humanity. While Jesus does teach a different way to live, the Bible is clear that humanity isn't going to change by itself. So instead, in its account, it says that Jesus takes the punishment humanity deserves by dying on a cross in their place. I think the very premise of the Yellow Turban Rebellion bears out the flaws in the Taiping Jing's teaching. We presume that Changzhou identified himself as this celestial master, and for 10 years he taught his disciples. But by 184 AD, we know that he's given up on trying to save the world by teaching alone. And we know that because he led this rebellion. So what's changed? Maybe Changzhou has become ambitious. Or maybe he's decided that teaching is too slow a method to change humanity and to save it from themselves. We'll obviously never know, but I have my suspicions. 
So there is this big similarity, but also a divergence. And I just find that fascinating. I suppose we should now talk about the time in which they rose, that the yellow turbans just didn't appear out of nowhere, that everyone got, oh, this is a great book. I'll just wrap some yellow around my head and risk my life in revolt. Why did, in that period of time, the yellow turbans become a force, a popular following? Gongjin, do you want to take that one? Yep. So actually, in the in the two decades before the yellow turbans rose, there was actually a lot of disasters. A particular severe one was the floods. In fact, six severe floods were recorded in its history in these two decades. So first, the first one came in about year 167, when there was a great flood across six provinces. And another one occurred just four years later. And in 173, another major flood hit the coastal regions. The next year, the Luo River, which flows through the capital Luoyang, was also flooded. And in the next year, after that, 175, three floods occurred, uh, occurred across the various counties and commanderies. And lastly, in 183, uh, the year before, there was also another flood in the Liang province. So you can see that these floods were actually recurring very frequently. And this is certainly disastrous for the civilians who, who, were, who lost their homes, lost their livelihoods and families in all these disasters. And when these sufferings were not addressed adequately, I would imagine that the unhappiness can become a huge driver for uprisings and rebellions. And I think it's worth saying, isn't it, that the yellow turbans had been active for a decade before the rebellion actually happened. So they'd spent a lot of time um, evangelizing, telling people about the way of great peace and convincing people of that uh, before they rebelled. And so they probably did have great buy-in, as Gonjin says, from the floods and from the repercussions of floods, because one of the issues with floods is it damages food supply. And so the fact there was floods led to famine and all kinds of other issues. And then there was the Antin Antonian plague, wave after wave of the wave of epidemics, which would tap particularly into an organization offering a religious route a potential for healing, like yeah. the other term. Which is particularly interesting because no other religion active in China at that time, because Confucianism, for example, which was the major um, thought system, isn't a religion per se, it's a philosophy, and it didn't offer any means for healing. And so if uh, these plagues were hitting people and they were dying and there wasn't any expert medical advice, where could they turn? Where they could turn to faith and religion. And the established religion of its day, Confucianism, had no answers. And so you're right. I think at that point, the Yellow Turbans had tremendous buy-in from people because they did offer a way of um, healing, which if a pandemic was hitting that they had no other way of dealing with, you can see why it appealed so much. Gongjin, how did the Yellow Turbans try to cure those who had fallen sick from this unknown pandemic that just kept coming and coming. Well, one of the primary methods was the confession of sins and also the giving out of supposedly holy water that is supposed to cure all these diseases. And it seems to work for some people, which I believe is one of the reasons why it got so widespread and so popular amongst people. But even that's really cruel, actually, because if you didn't, if you weren't healed, it was because your faith was inadequate or you had not confessed your sins properly um which means that people were going home not healed having um believing it was their own fault that they hadn't been healed and their families believed it was their fault that they hadn't been healed which is just brutal they can't with so much going wrong and discontent with the government by various problems like farmers losing their well farms why uh, were there other groups that were trying to tap into the troubles and offering their own uh, relief, as it were? Yeah, so one really prominent group, uh, which I mentioned earlier, are the Five Pecks of Rice movement, um, which sometimes gets associated with the Yellow Turbans. Certainly, um, hi historical sources from about 60 years ago tried to tie them together really closely. Um, so the Five Pecks of Rice were a Taoist movement, they may well have had um, the Taiping Jing, and they did do healings in a similar way. And the leader of that movement uh, was a guy called Chang Lu, 
who's got the same surname as the Chang brothers. Uh, so you can see why there are parallels there and why people join them. But they took place in completely different parts of the country, and there is no evidence whatsoever that they communicated with each other. But to answer your question, Jude, they did do, uh, did believe in miraculous healings, and they had very similar ways of going about uh, doing them. And so clearly there were other groups and other sects that were going about uh, offering miraculous healings, uh, not just in with the same method, but in a variety of different ways. In the South, actually, there was also a very similar kind of cult and healing going on uh, with this person called Yu Ji, also written as Ganji in some history texts. It's basically also a kind of Taoist that's based in uh, southeastern China to, uh, then. What's interesting about that, Gong Jin, is that the group I've mentioned, the Five Pecks of Rice, and the group that you've uh, mentioned that's associated with Ganji, they were both peaceful. Um, they they didn't uh, do a rebellion. The Five Pecks of Rice took over their city and um, made it a religious state, but they didn't attempt to expand any further, um, unlike the Yellow Turbans. So what, what's different about them? Well, I guess they were the most popular. They were the most successful group. They had the most followers in different parts of the country, which perhaps led them to believe that they could rebel and be successful compared to the others. But I also wonder if that meant that the government conflated them all into one group. They were No one in power in the central court were Taoist, and so they probably weren't bothered enough to investigate these different groups and to see if they were and see the differences. Instead, they probably just saw them as a Taoist monolith that disagreed with them and couldn't tell that they were actually separate groups that had different practices and um, different methodologies. That leads us perfectly into our next section, when that the Yellow Turbans, after a decade or so, as a religious educational group, began to plot against the Han. And the Han, at, for reasons that you just mentioned, just ignored it, apart from a few courtiers don't really get a sense of when the tide begins to turn within the turbans, that when it be begins to change into a plot. But well, you say that, and you probably are right, but I noticed as I read through uh, the primary sources today that they only started uh, recruiting members in Luoyang in 184 AD, and I wonder, therefore, if the decision to become a rebellious group rather than a peaceful religious one was one that was made actually really quite late in the day. Or whether that was just like the final part of the plot, if you get the provinces and then try the capital. You can but... definitely interpret it both ways. But it, it did strike me that having been a movement for 10 years, um, that they only started trying to get uh, followers in the capital that late on, <laughs> just implied that it certainly came a lot later. Than, um it, I don't believe it was Changzhou's original plan, I guess is what I'm saying. Gongjin, do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's very plausible. I mean, I think in history, we can see that a lot of times people do change when they get more power and, and, and strength. And it does seem that with more followers and with more influence over the state, maybe Changzhou and Zhang brothers wanted to achieve something even bigger and hence their advance to the capital. We do have evidence of a uh, Han court figures in contact with yellow turban figures which once the revolt came out became a bit embarrassing but how many of the Han figures would have necessarily been interested in the revolt aspect or were sharing a religious interest? That's a really good question and I guess to some degree we don't know the answer I can imagine that there was um, a lot of people in the court for whom they were just interested in the religious side. As we've mentioned earlier, Confucianism didn't have all that much to say about healings. And it wasn't just peasants who were going to be affected by the Antonian plague. There were also going to be um, nobility that were dying from that and court officials. And so you can see why there were some that would be interested in the religious angle. But we do know that two eunuchs were involved in the plot, don't we, Gongjin? Yep, yep, yep. And interestingly, in English, they sound like the same character. Uh, one is called Feng Shui and one is called Shui Feng. So it, it sounds like a silly transcription mistake in English, but actually, uh, they're actually two distinct people with distinct characters in Chinese. Yeah, so there were two eunuchs, as Gonjin said, Feng Zhu and Zhu Feng, um, who we know were plotting with the yellow turbans and were actually executed for doing so. 
uh, when the plot came out. And so whilst maybe not everyone in the court who was involved in the way of peace were being rebellious, certainly some people were. If I recall rightly, Emperor Han had an interest, encouraged by members of his palace and his family, in the Huang Lo, both on a personal and political level. And some members of the court certainly seem to have maintained that interest after his death. Other than that, I think uh, there was also a case of the one of the ten attendants, uh, Zhang Rang, having his uh, retainers contact the Yellow Turbans as well. And it was found, I, I think it was found by one of the court officials and they used this as an excuse to uh, criticize the ten attendants. But of course, they got away with it. Yeah, and, and as you say, Emperor Huan and the previous emperor had himself worshipped the Yellow Emperor. But interestingly, some believed that the Yellow Emperor was going to be reincarnated at various times through history. And the more seditious, rebellious elements of Taoist belief believed that it was time for reincarnation of the Yellow Emperor. And that would involve overthrowing the Han Emperor in order to put him on the throne. And presumably Changzhe was claiming to be that reincarnation. Uh, whereas that clearly wasn't what Emperor Huan was seeking to promote and certainly not what members of the established court were believing because it would undermine themselves as much as uh, the emperor. What about the plot, the, the one stretching across many provinces, the grand plan? If, pe- if there hadn't been a betrayal, do you think it could work or was it just rather unwieldy? I think it... It certainly could have been quite successful, actually. Uh, one of the keys was getting into Luoyang uh, quickly. Uh, so if they could have seized the capital and potentially killed the emperor, then they could have been a, a very successful group. Uh, the Han dynasty didn't have a large established army. And so if they could have caught them by surprise and could have negated the importance of the northern army by securing Luoyang, then yeah, I, I could see it being successful. What do you think, Gongjin? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very possible that there will be some really severe repercussions uh, if the plot wasn't revealed early, especially given that, as you said, the armies were quite small and I don't think they were well prepared as well given the declining state of the Han then. Now, what would be interesting was whether having seized power, they could have hung on to it. The Yellow Turbans were prominent in a few regions of China, but there were large swathes which were completely untouched by this movement and in time you could imagine a a counter-rebellion growing up elsewhere so whilst i think they could have seized power i'm less certain whether they could have held on to it once they'd got it yeah especially since i think most of these people were probably not trained in military skills unlike professional army so whether they could hold for so long would indeed be a significant challenge in the long run but unfortunately for the yellow turbans the plot was betrayed just how Did the betrayal impact the turban's chances of actually succeeding? Uh, Ma Yuanyi, the the plot was revealed when the uh, spy in Luoyang, um, Ma Yuanyi was caught. And that was quite significant given that uh, connections and information from the capital was really influential and critical in organizing and managing the eventual sequence of events for the rebellion. So when the information was cut off and it was found that that was the plan for the various uh, provinces, I would imagine that local officials would have the ability to disrupt some of the rebellion efforts and, and that would really hamper their overall rebellion. Yeah, so there was no system more efficient at transporting messages than the Han Dynasty um, horse system, which meant that they were able to get messages out to uh, local leaders to um, raise, to conscript soldiers to deal with the threats before they'd uh, before the yellow turbans had raised, whereas if the yellow turbans had raised first, um, as I said, there were very few standing armies in Han China. It would have been far harder to respond after uh, the yellow turbans had already taken places. Um, and it also forced the yellow turbans to raise up sooner than they had intended, which came with the downside that not everyone did because uh, many of them were farmers. Uh, we said that not all of them were peasants, but many of them were. And if you're a farmer, and you rise up at the wrong time of year, that means you lose your crop, um, which means that you're going to starve. And so many didn't want to raise up because they didn't want the consequences of that. How did the early war go when the turbans had local advantage? 
how much did the Zhang brothers manage to raise in 184? Uh, I think in Emperor Ling's bio, it was biography, it was stated that there was about 360,000 people raising. But I would say that is probably an over exaggeration, given that the uprising went early and not, I believe, not all of them rose. So it's a lot less than I expect people think when they think of the turbans, sort of the idea of this popular revolt. But... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you hear of a widespread rebellion like that, that is a popular movement, and you know the size of China and the population of China, you're definitely thinking bigger numbers than 360,000, aren't you? What about the Han forces? We usually get a focus on those who will become the great leaders of the in the future. But well, what about the three main commanders chosen, Gong Jin? The three main commanders were Zhu Jin, Huang Fushong, and Lu Zhi. Zhu Jin was a man from the south, and as the local inspector, successfully pacified numerous rebellions in the Jiao province previously. Huang Fushong was the nephew of the general Huang Fugui and came from a military background. His forefathers were actively involved in numerous campaigns over the years. Lu Zhi was perhaps more famously known for being a scholar and a mentor to some big names of the Three Kingdoms. But during his time in office in Yang province, he was also very successful at addressing various local rebellions. Essentially, all of these three commanders were experienced in military affairs, which was probably why they were chosen to be the main commanders in the first place. So under these experienced figures, how big was the Han army for fighting the turbans? Interesting question. And to some sense, I can't give you a conclusive answer. We know that combined, Huang Fu Song and Chu Jin's army were 40,000 men. We don't know how they were divided when they separated their forces, which we'll come to in a moment. And we had no idea how many men Lu Qi uh, commanded. But if the other two had 40,000 combined, I think that should give us a sense of scale. Um, maybe he had about 40,000 men as well. Now, the core of both of these armies were the Northern Army. That, uh, the Northern Army was based in Luoyang, and it was the only uh, really professional force that the Han Dynasty uh, had at its disposal. It was made up of 3,500 men, um, and they were split into five regiments. Those regiments were the foot soldiers, archers who shoot at sound, the elite cavalry, the garrison cavalry, and the Chang River cavalry. Uh, that last regiment were made up of Wuhan, um, who were horse archers. The archers would have um, had crossbows, and the foot soldiers were equipped with halberds, swords, and spears. But they were only 3,500 men, and each regiment um, was made up, therefore, of 700 men. The rest of the army uh, were conscription soldiers. And we know that Huang Fu Song's force came from Hainan, the capital commandery, and the two commanderies to the north. But that's all we really know about the makeup of the armies. So we've discussed the turbans the Han army raised to face them, including hills to lead the forces. In the early stages as the Han gathered its forces, the turbans did capture a few Han kings, and some plans were nipped in the bud by the speed of the Han response. However, there was warfare, and I think we should ha take a brief look at how the campaign historically went. Why don't you kick us off in the first stronghold to fall, Steve? Yes, so Yu province was the domain of Bo Sai. In my opinion, the most capable of the Yellow Turban commanders. We know that he was a large division commander, and we think that his forces were more than 20,000 men, but certainly not much more than 40,000. So he's larger than Chu Jin or Huang Fu Song's armies when they separated, but certainly not much larger than them combined, and probably a bit smaller. Now, Chu Jin took his army, probably about 20,000 men. We don't know exactly how they split them, but he was the first to encounter Bosai's force. And all the sources tell us about that conflict is that Chu Jin lost. However, Karl Laban makes some observations from the source's silences. He notices, for example, that there is no mention of an administrator or any local forces. So he suggests from that that Bosai had already taken Yangdi the capital for the commandery, and defeated all the local forces. So probably the Yellow Turbans were using that city as a base. He also points out that it took Chu Jin almost a month to retake the field after this loss. And so the Han forces probably took quite a bashing. I suspect that Chu Jin was complacent 
He expected an easy victory. He therefore attacked a large force in a well-defended location and got completely routed. So when Huang Fu Song heard about Chu Jin's defeat, he decided to go on the defensive. He marched to Changxi City and Bo Sai, flushed with his recent victory, advanced after him and laid siege to that city. Huang Fu Song's men became demoralized as they were outnumbered and obviously Bo Sai's men were full of confidence. They'd just beaten a Han army. However, Huang Fu Song is a talented general, so he comes up with a cunning plan. He'd noticed that the yellow turbans had made a mistake. Bo Sai had made their camp in a highly flammable location. So one windy night, Huang Fu Song sent some of his men over the wall and they set fire to the yellow turbans base. The Han army then attacked in the chaos and it was the turn of the yellow turbans to rout. And just at that moment, Cao Cao arrived leading a cavalry force. So the yellow turbans ran um, and Huang Fu Song, Chu Jin and Cao Cao decided to combine their forces to defeat Bo Sai's army once and for all. The two armies met back at Yangdi. Presumably, Bo Sai's forces had returned to a secure city and somewhere they'd already won a great victory. However, this wasn't to be repeated and the army was defeated with Bo Sai being killed. The remaining uh, members of that force tried to flee, we presume towards Changzhou's headquarters, but they were still being pursued by the combined armies of Huang Fu Song, Chu Jin and Cao Cao. Now, one of Chu Jin's officers was a certain Song Jian, and he advanced too far in front of the main army with his personal unit, and he bit off a bit more than he could chew. Uh, he got into a conflict and he was injured, fell from his horse whilst his force scattered. However, Jian's horse proved to be something of a hero. Uh, this horse went and found some of his men and annoyed them until they followed this horse. And the horse led them back to Jian's prone body. Son Jian was rescued and a few weeks later he was back leading the charge. But soon after this incident, the yellow turbans were caught um, in Runan Commandery near Luoyang. Pang Tu, Bo Sai's replacement, was killed and the army completely destroyed at which point the Han forces separated to go to some of the other theatres of war. Gon Jin, I think you're going to tell us about them. Yes, up north, the main action was in Ji province where the three brothers were at. Lu Zhi was originally sent up north, and initially he obtained great victories over the turbans, forcing the Zhang brothers to retreat to Guangzhong. Lu Zhi then built siege equipment to prepare for an attack. However, Lu Zhi refused to bribe the eunuch sent by the emperor to observe the battlefield, and therefore he was framed by the eunuch and stripped off his position. The court then sent Dong Zhuo over, but Dong Zhuo could not take control of the nearby Qiyang town that Zhang Bao occupied. Dong Zhuo was then recalled and replaced by Huang Fushong. Before Huang Fushong could reach Guangzhong though, Zhang Jue had already died of illness. So at Guangzhong, Huang Fushong fought with his brother Zhang Liang. Zhang Liang's soldiers were well trained and Huang Fushong could not overcome them, so he stopped offences and waited for an opportunity. Zhang Liang's troops became complacent over their seemingly successful defence against Huang Fushong, and that was exactly what the Huang Fushong was waiting for. He utilised this complacency to launch an attack early in the morning, defeating Zhang Liang and his turbans. A month later, the turbans at Qiyang, led by Zhang Bao, were also defeated by Huang Fushong, and the Ji province was specified. In the south, more action happened at Wan, in northern Jing province. It all started with the Nanyang Yellow Turbans, led by Zhang Manchen, who self-proclaimed as the messenger of God. Zhang Manchen was originally doing very well. He gathered a few 10,000 people and managed to kill the local grand administrator, taking over the city of Wan. However, his success did not last long, and soon he was defeated by local officers. The remaining turbans led by Zhao Hong regrouped, grew in size, and continued to occupy Wan. When Huang Fushong was dispatched to the north to replace Dong Zhuo, Zhu Jun was sent south to take care of these remaining turbans in Wan. The initial stage of Wan ran for two months, but Zhu Jun still could not defeat the rebels. As a result, the court became unhappy, and Zhu Jun was pressured to strike again. This time around, he managed to kill the leader Zhao Hong, but the turbans continued to help Wan and elected a new leader, Han Zhong. Now, Zhu Jin did not have the upper hand in numbers, so he came out with a decoy attack in the southwest to draw the turbans, himself leading elite soldiers broke into the city from the northeast. Han Zhong retreated into the citadel and sought to surrender. 
Zhu Jun refused but couldn't break them until he lured Han Zhong into an open battle. In this open battle, Han Zhong was defeated and surrendered. Yet, local officials out of spite killed Han Zhong after he surrendered, causing great unrest in the turbans. The remaining turbans then, led by Sun Xia, again controlled one to resist Zhu Jun. It was only after some time that Jujin finally broke open the city, killed Sun Xia, and finally pacified the one area. And that marks the end of the Yellow Turban Rebellion. Why did the Han one state, apart from the early advantage they got of discovering the plot, why did they win? And how much credit should we give the court? Well, He Jin himself deserves some credit, I think. Because, first of all, he discovered the rebellion. And actually, when the Han Dynasty found out about it and heard what he said they did respond promptly they sent forces out quite quickly they put competent men in charge of their armies um and they did seem to equip their armies quite well so i i think actually to be fair to the han court once they finally took the threat seriously they did handle it fairly well uh, why did the han dynasty win against the Oturbans? i think is a part of the question you're asking well because they had superior generals um they had um more professional soldiers and they were better um provisioned and equipped do you agree gong jin absolutely and i think on the yellow turban spot many of them were as we mentioned earlier farmers and pro people i, I doubt that they have professional training and i doubt they have professional provisions and uh, I doubt that they have stable supplies as well. So I, I'll imagine they'll be, they were pretty hungry for most of the fight as well. It will not last long. They hadn't been able to harvest their crops, had they? You'd think yeah. if the rebellion had happened when they'd intended and they'd been able to bring their harvest with them, they would have been in a far better position. So what was the attitude of the Han court and its armies towards the people who had risen in a major revolt against them? Well, interestingly... Uh, you spoke about the response of the court and the response of the armies. Perhaps they responded slightly differently. I think the court were quite happy to issue pardons. They actually issued a, a general pardon to everyone involved in the rebellion, except for the Chang brothers themselves. However, that didn't quite filter down to the army, who were pretty brutal. Uh, the most obvious example of that is the Battle of the City of Wan, which was the capital of Jing province, um, where no quarter was shown whatsoever. And that's actually a question that's asked in the novel of, uh, by Liu Bei of, well, why won't you let them surrender? And the commander, Chu Jin, says, well, why would I let them surrender? If I let them surrender, then people will believe there's no consequences for rebelling. Whereas if I kill them all, then it will make people hesitate to rebel in the future. Were there turban commanders who shone in this brief rebellion was there anyone who sort of stands out for you as having done well in difficult circumstances yeah i think the most remarkable for me was botai i think we mentioned it a bit earlier uh he was uh he was one of those rebels that actually defeated the zujin which came out to be one of the main commanders in the battle and even when huang fushong went to help zujin he was also uh temporarily surrounded uh, and stranded uh, at Changshe by Bo Chai initially, which goes to show that actually, at least at that point, he was quite superior in terms of tactics and military wise. Yeah, I agree. He's the standout figure. I um the fact that it required Chu Jin and Huang Fu Song to combine their forces to defeat them, and even then he had them surrounded in a city on the back foot. Uh, I think that's really impressive. Two that stand out for me, uh, Zhang Liang, because. It's described that his troops were excess, very well trained, and that when Hong Fu Song got his chance to going off, he actually found it very, very difficult, mm. and had to try and tie them out before and then attack when they were relaxed. So I think that deserves credit. I think also while no one figure gets a lot of credit, the turbans around one just for they kept coming back and it must have been a bit embarrassing for the Han to lose what was something of their third capital, the sort of a, the home base of the Liu clan, as it were. Yeah, I mean, Zhang Meng Chang was the commander at that point, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, and so he did win a significant battle. So yeah, I, I agree. I think all three of those figures do deserve credit. What did it tell us about the state of the Han that there was quite a bit of sacking going on? Uh, Lu Zhu was arrested and put in a cage cart 
Dong Zhou had a go, got sacked. Hong Fu Song eventually got there. Su Jun was nearly recalled from the field because he was struggling at one. What does that say about the state of the Han towards its own armies? I think it says quite a lot of things. Um, I think it says that there was bribery going on. Uh, so one of the reasons that uh, Lu Qi loses his uh, position as general initially is because he refuses to pay a bribe. So I think we can see bribery going on. I think there's a lack of trust from the central court towards its figures. I think there's an arrogance there that they presume that they should be able to crush the yellow turbans very easily. Um, and I wonder if it also shows a lack of understanding of what it's like to actually fight in a military campaign and that there will be slower times and there would need to be sieges, for example, in the example of Chu Jun and Wan. Um, and I just don't think that was appreciated by the central court. One final thing before we move on to the aftermath. Uh, often Lu Bei, Cao Cao and Sun Jian and other people talked about for this campaign. But at the time, we do get... And you touched, you both touched on this in episode two. What does that tell us about Hong Fu Song and also about how people felt towards the turbans when they're so crushed that, that, that they celebrated the victor? Yeah, there was actually a famous, a very famous poem that's recorded in history about uh, Hong Fu Song. And the, poem, and the poem goes When a nation became chaotic, cities turned into ruins. Mothers couldn't protect their sons, and wives lost their husbands. Thanks to Lord Huang Fu, we were able to live in peace. So this poem actually, first and foremost, taught us really good things about Huang Fu Song's victories and how people really admire him for his victories. And I think it also does goes to show that not all the civilians and not all the ordinary people were supportive of the yellow turbans. A lot of them also actually suffered from this balance and really would want to get rid of the turbans. You can imagine, even if you were sympathetic to the cause, when it started having real life implications for you, when uh, there was less food because farmers were off fighting or your crops had been destroyed because someone had trampled over them uh, or whatever it was, you can understand sympathy running out pretty quickly, can't you? At which point the person that brings stability is going to be a hero. Oh. I do think it's interesting that Huang Fu Song was someone who at the time was really recognised as a significant figure, uh, yet um, he's a footnote in history. Uh, because of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, most people don't even associate him with the yellow turbans. Um, the one Han figure that's recognised as He Jin, and beyond not that... Not in a positive way. Not in a positive <laughs> way. And beyond that, people tend to think of, as you say, Cao Cao, Liu Bei, and Sun Jian. Who, by the way, of the three, I think Sun Jian deserves the most most credit for this campaign. Particularly as he got wounded. Um, so Liu Bei had a smallish role in the north that gained him vital experience but very much a local affair it was Sun Yun was with the main army for yeah. a lot of it. Cao Cao provided important reinforcements in the battle that eventually defeated Bo Bo Sai, didn't he? So that like that is significant, a cavalry detachment. But Sun Jian was an active member throughout the campaign and according to his own biography, not mentioned in Chu Jun's it's Worth saying, but in his own biography, it does say that he was the first over the wall when one finally broke. The turbans are dead. Stephen looks downcast. But what about the aftermath? What did this mean for the Han politically? Did they make changes to try and deal with any problems that have been exposed? I think the the whole uprising and the whole cures that followed the Yellow Turban rebellion initially does shows that. Uh, the regional regionally, the, the there needs to be stronger military control over the different areas, and this I would say this aided in the setting up of regional supervisors, uh, by the court, which uh showed a uh, weakened central control over time. That's the creation of the governorships or the revival of the governorships. I said so. Yeah, uh, and next uh, is the fact that He Jin was promoted as a result of this. At uh, at this point, he was. Was he attendant of Henan? Was that his official rank? Yes, he was the intendant yep. of Henan. Uh, yeah. Um, and he goes from that to being commander in chief of the army, which is obviously a significant role. And uh, we'll see in the next few episodes what He Jin does with that responsibility and the impact that has on the government going forward. But actually, his promotion is really significant because of the ongoing implications of him. 
And Hong Fu Song, uh, his role wasn't quite over. His popularity put him in a bit of an awkward position with one advisor. Yes, all these victories put Huang Fuxiong in an awkwardly influential position to do many things. After the end of the rebellion, a former magistrate advised Huang Fuxiong to take advantage of the power and popularity he amassed from pacifying the yellow turbans to rise up and seize the realm. But Huang Fuxiong refused. And this is a recurring theme in the next few years where we have other people coming along selling similar ideas to Huang Fuxiong. And Huang Fuxiong rejected all of them, sometimes at the cost of putting himself in danger. This really demonstrates his character as someone who is upright and loyal to the Han court, especially in comparison to some others who would gladly take this opportunity to seize power, to become warlords and so on. Now, of course, his upright personality did cause discontent among some people, and as he chose to not get involved in power and politics, he does get sidelined from the main story. As this Crespin puts it, he's someone too honourable for his time. It's such a shame he fades from history. He sounds amazing. I think one thing worth pointing out when we, as we start to go into the cultural memory of the yellow turbans, sort of the way people see them now, uh, is there's often a perception of the Han were relying on warlords, sort of having to call upon others to help them. Do you think that's fair? So I think Sun Jian perhaps is a proto warlord. The army that he gathers or that he brings uh, to Chu Jin is based upon his personal followers and conscripts that he's been given direct authority to bring with him. But no, not really. Um, after the war ends, Sun Jian is um, given rank and he disbands this personal army. He just takes a few royal, a loyal uh, retainers with him. Um, Cao Cao and Liu Bei both become standard officers again. And um, no, so there aren't, aren't warlords yet, but I do think we see the first seeds of what will lead to warlords coming later on. The turbans have a very particular role in the story with both the novel and video games that they act as a starting point for the era. You get to meet the three families that will dominate the wars to come. Has this overinflated their importance or would you call this the start of the era? No, I think it's overinflated the importance of the yellow turbans as fascinating as I find them. I think the far more significant rebellion is actually the the lang uh lang rebellion that follows on from it which rather gets lost um in romance of the three kingdoms and modern retellings but because of the impact it has on dong Zhuo, um i think it's a far more important rebellion but as you say the reason we all think about the yellow turbans as the start of this period is because that's where the romance of the three kingdoms starts and the Romance of the Three Kingdoms starts there because it's a convenient way of introducing us to Leo Bei, Sun Jian, and Cao Cao. Yeah, absolutely. I would think that although the Yellow Turban Rebellion was quite a big thing then, it wasn't as significant compared to the Liang Rebellion later. This Liang Rebellion we see after the Yellow Turbans was pretty much a continuation of the long-going Liang conflict Letter Han had struggled with for almost its entire existence. This problem is fundamentally an ethnic tension that the Letter Han court did not or could not address thoroughly, and hence creates a repetitive cycle of rebellions, armies driving in to stop them, armies out, and rebellions again. Remember one of our key generals, Huang Fuxiong? His uncle Huang Fugui was actually one of the main generals sent out to resolve the Liang rebellions during Emperor Huan's time. And it's extremely costly to keep sending armies in, so much so that there were even discussions on giving up Liang province altogether. So certainly, Liang problems were more of a headache and a game changer than the ones of Yellow Turban Rebellion. Do you think the lack of information about the turbans allows people to sort of see them in a way they want to, that it's peasants, that they could be heroes, they could be villains who'd gone out of control and threatened order? Yeah, undoubtedly. I mean, the yellow turbans have been imprinted on, for example, by the Communist Party, for whom a peasant rebellion is something that's going to fit the narrative that they wanted to communicate. So I think that they have been used by various different factions at different times to um, to suit their own narratives. Yeah, I think the ambiguity doesn't certainly help in the sense that because we know so little about them and all we know about them are little pieces of information here and there, it is very easy for us to use this information to craft a convincing story for our side. 
And I, I guess that's also part of the reason why it's so fascinating. I suppose my final question to you both is, what do you two both think of the turbans? Where do you look back on them? Any particular impressions or sort of things you would like to people to remember? Looking back, I think the Yellow Turban Rebellion is a reflection of the people's discontent with things in life. For many people then, this was also when they started their careers, where they make a name for themselves, like Sun Jian, and eventually they would become big names of the era. One quite interesting point is that the rebellion's name carried on long after the main turban forces were eliminated. We have various groups of people following the turbans. We have Zhang Yin and his Black Mountain Bandits that rose together with the Yellow Turbans. We have Yang Feng and his White Wave Bandits that were originally Yellow Turbans. And also the different groups collectively known as the Yellow Turban Remnants across various provinces. We even have records of these people after the year 200, that is almost 20 years after the original Yellow Turban Rebellion. We don't know how sincere these people were to the original Yellow Turban course, but they do highlight the lasting impression of the Yellow Turban Rebellion amongst the people. I think this is something that we often do not think about, but worth remembering. I think the first thing that came to my mind when you asked that question, as a reflection on the Yellow Turbans, is I wish they'd stayed a peaceful movement, and I wonder if they would have had far more influence if they hadn't gone to war and had continued with their evangelism, offering hope to downtrodden people. I, I just can't help but think that would have been far more, would have led them to having far more influence. I always enjoy sort of their narrative role and people that, how they've sort of become the big symbol of the Han problems. They're more symptom than a cause, but they just show to a lot of people that things have just got very, very bad. But... And I think that's a really good point. Maybe that's another reason why it's a convenient start to the novel because they do symbolise all the issues with the Han court that, as you say, are the things that lead to its eventual collapse. And so, as you say, if we view them as a symbol rather than a symptom rather than a cause, then I think they do have an important part to play in the tale of the fall of the Han dynasty in the Three Kingdoms. That seems a good point to end. I hope everyone enjoyed listening to this deep dive on the short but memorable rebellion. A big thank you to Stephen and Gong Jin for your most interesting contributions. To finish off our turban section of the podcast, Stephen and I are going to be interviewing Baptiste Wu on his new book, Rise of the Yellow Sky, about Lu Ha with a focus on his growing up and his time with the yellow turbans. Stephen and I both very much enjoyed the book and look forward to discussing it with the author. Wherever you are, I wish everyone goodbye and thank you for listening. Goodbye. Bye, thank you.